On 2 June 1665, while nearing Paris on a chariot, Gian Lorenzo Bernini presented his soon-to-become friend, Paul Fréard de Chanteloup, with an eloquent speech, a manifesto of his ideas for the project of redesigning the Louvre. You have here one of these projects. On that occasion, Chanteloup records in his journal, Bernini declared, the beauty of everything in the world, including architecture, consists of proportion. One may say that it is a divine component of art, for it originated with Adam's body, which was not only made by God's hands, but was shaped in his image and likeness. The variety of the architectural orders relies on the difference between the male and the female body, and on their differing proportions. Far from being a fleeting thought, the conviction that the human body foregrounds the definition of any artistic canon was deeply rooted in Bernini's mind. A month later, on 1st July, Bernini repeated to Chanteloup that architecture consisted in proportion derived from the human body, adding, this is why sculptors and painters succeed in architecture better than anyone else, especially because they incessantly study after man's figure, end of quote. In uttering these sentiments, Bernini may or may not have borne in mind a passage from Federico Zuccari's Idea dei Pittori e Scultori, uh, 167. It is certainly true that the form and artifice of the human body, which is our primary object, are the reason of the greater quality and value of our art. It is conspicuously composed of such a quality and quantity of bones, flesh, nerves, and muscles, assembled with such order, artifice, and measure, that it rightly appears to be a divine work in the simulacrum of God. This is why Job said, Lord, your hands shaped me, you clothed me with skin and flesh, and knitted me together with bones and sinews. And it is well known that God left the crafting of man for last, as if he wished to make it the epitome of his might, wisdom, and goodness. Neither Bernini nor Zuccari were the only artists to invoke scripture with the purpose of extolling the human body as the divine principle of artistic creation. In describing Michelangelo's creation of Adam in the Sistine Chapel, Rome, Giorgio Vasari singled out the figure of the first man, depicted in terms of beauty, attitude, and contours with such a quality that he seems to have been created anew by his supreme and prime creator rather than by the brush and drawing of such a man. More paradoxically, Vasari suggested that Michelangelo had preempted God's work in carving his Moses for San Pietro in Vincoli, Rome. Every aspect of craftsmanship is so perfected here that Moses can be said to be the friend of God now more than ever, since God, through the hands of Michelangelo, has set out to assemble and prepare his body for resurrection before those of others. Besides referring perhaps to Job's evocation of skin and flesh, bones and sinews as the materials knitted together by the creator in shaping man, the concept of a divine assemblage of the human body is crucial here as it connotes sculpture as God's primary means of invention and crafting. Praising sculpture as superior to painting, Bernini, on 6 October 1665, pointed out that sculpture is something true. Une vérité, but painting is deception, which is the work of the devil, whereas sculpture is that of God who was himself a sculptor because he made and formed man with earth, not in an instant, but in the manner of sculptures. The full extent of Bernini's brazenness in uh, staking out the superiority of sculpture on theological grounds becomes evident if we consider that the opposite claim was prevalent at that time, painting being ranked higher than sculpture because it indeed encompassed and entailed deception, that is, sheer artifice. Bernini was acutely aware of the limits of any sculptural medium in rendering the visual and tactile impression of the human body. 
More than once, he makes the point only to object that sculpture requires even more artifice than painting in order to remedy its lack of color and intrinsic hardness. In Bernini's view, the ability to soften and animate even the hardness of stones so that it morphs into skin and flesh had eluded Michelangelo. Instructing Chantelou in this regard, Bernini on 25th June 1665 remarked that Michelangelo was a divine architect, given his unmatched draftsmanship, but he was inferior in painting and sculpture, for he was unable to make the figures appear made of flesh, de chair, although they were beautiful and remarkable with regard to anatomy. Agreeing with Bernini, Chantelou further belittled Michelangelo's female figures, which abounded in muscles, such as his much celebrated night in the Medici Chapel, Florence. On another occasion, Bernini recounted Annibale Carracci's reaction to Michelangelo's recent Christ in Santa Maria Sopra Minerva, Rome. The figure of Christ was beautiful, but in order to understand it well, Annibale explained, it was necessary to consider how bodies were made at that time, mocking Michelangelo for not imitating nature. It is significant that in the 17th century, Michelangelo's recent Christ turned into a lightning rod for all sorts of criticisms. For Marchese Vincenzo Giustiniani, the great collector and supporter of the young Caravaggio, we have here the crowning of thorns in the exhibition, who was commissioned by him, Michelangelo's statue was certainly most beautiful and done with hardship and diligence, but in the end, it just looked like a, a sculpture deprived as it was of vivacity and spirit. In other words, Michelangelo's work remained a mere block of marble, shaped like a human figure, yet inanimate. In drawing this conclusion, Giustiniani was unfavorably comparing Michelangelo's statue to a famed antique, the Vatican Miliager. This marble figure, Giustiniani argued, was so utterly endowed with ineffable expressions of vivacity that it seemed to breathe. In his Microcosmo della Pittura, Francesco Scannelli also criticized with vehemence the proportions of Michelangelo's recent Christ, which was of a square complexion, of large limbs, well studied and contrived in every part, these last two terms used negatively in this context. As a result, the figure proved most fitting in the guise of a gardener or a laborer. He was a peasant for him. As much as he differed from that grace, exceptional conformation, and rare delicacy that the most knowledgeable tend to wish for in representing the, human, the humanized Christ." End of quote. Surprisingly enough, Bernini, Annibale Caracci, Giustiniani, and Scannelli do not seem to refer to the same statue. The reasons for their scathing remarks are so disparate that put together, they contradict one another. At the same time, the recent Christ is too ideal or too naturalistic. As for Michelangelo, his reliance on antiquity doomed his art to failure, his figures being bones and muscles without flesh and blood. These contradictions are historically meaningful, for they exceed the purview of a mere assessment of Michelangelo's artistry, revealing a discontinuity between Vasari's Maniera Moderna, the modern age for Vasari, and Bernini's age. Scholars, instead, tend to assume a continuity between the Renaissance and the Baroque body, and casting even a distracted look at 17th century art theoretical literature, it would make sense to share this opinion, since both the Baroque terminology and conceptual framework stem directly from the art theory and practice developed from Leon Battista Alberti to Vasari. It thus comes as little surprise that the invention of the Baroque body has never emerged as, as a historical question in our discipline. The general assumption is that from the Caracci to Bernini, the Renaissance body underwent a process of elaboration. It was not, it, it was not invented or reinvented, but was substantially readapted. It is even certain 
that most Baroque artists were simply convinced that they were following in the path of antiquity and the Renaissance canon. With the exception of Caravaggio, none of them ever came close to intimating that they had reinvented the human body, either in painting or sculpture. For all of them, invention unfolded within rules and with the aid of select models of the past, preeminence residing in improving upon, nor dismissing, the best achievements of the ancient and modern canon. And yet, starting with the Karachi in the late 1580s, the depiction of the human body was the object of such intense scrutiny and critical reflection that perhaps unbeknownst to most Baroque artists, it over time became something else altogether. During this process, the canonical balance between nature and the ideal, decorum and artifice was so dramatically subverted that the human body took on the roaring appearance of an aesthetic object, with nature expanded to incorporate the supernatural and therefore reduced to a guideline, the limit beyond which the human form would lose its anthropomorphic status. Needless to say, anthropomorphism comes with its own strict boundaries in the early modern period. On 23 August 1665, Bernini illustrated to Chantelou how he had solved the problem encountered in gauging the proportions of a figure he had sculpted and whose head appeared disproportionately small. Assisted by a friend, he remeasured the sculpted head along with those of two renowned antiques, the so-called Belvedere Antinos and the Belvedere Apollo. Through comparison, he concluded that the head of uh, his figure was absolutely fine, being a ninth of the entire body on the example of those ancient sculptures, and that the unpleasant effect depended on the presence of a drapery wrapped upon the figure's shoulder. Like Bernini, Nicolas Poussin had also taken the measure of the Antinos with great care, deeming them exemplary for the representation of youthful male bodies. The faith in and fascination with antiquity, however, had not initially inspired Annibale Carracci's attempt to reform the declining art of the Maniera Moderna. In one of his incendiary notes to Vasari's Life of Titian, Annibale commented, the ignorant Vasari does not realize that the good ancient masters derive their works from life, dal vivo, and claims it is good to copy after the antiques, which are secondary things, rather than from living things, which are the original, prime, and most primary things, and must always be copied. But Vasari didn't understand art. It is unclear when Annibale couched this unconventional view. Already in a letter of 18 April 1580, addressing his cousin Ludovico, Annibale voiced his astonishment at seeing with his own eyes Correggio's Il Giorno in Parma, in particular the figure of Saint Jerome, crying out, isn't that beautiful old man grander and more tender than in general that Saint Paul, who previously appeared to me a miracle and now looks like a wooden thing, so hard and sharp. Annibale was alluding to the male figure on the left foreground of Raphael's Ecstasy of Saint Cecilia, which was then on display in San Giovanni Monte, Bologna. Aside from rejecting Raphael as a paradigm in the representation of the human figure, Annibal embraced Correggio and Titian's painting as an alternative canon by which to abide. Their works, he stated, are the true ones, regardless of what others believe. I now know it, concluding, I like this straightforwardness, I like this purity, which is not very similar, but true and natural and not artificial and labored. Abjuring the primacy of both antiquity and Raphael, Annibale meant first and foremost to rid himself of the blaring veil of a secondary nature, mediated through the lesson of antiquity that prevented him from attaining the purity of a primordial nature, one breathing and palpitating, unpolluted and made of living flesh, carne viva. For Annibale, Correggio's little put indeed breathed live and laugh with such a grace and truth that you have to laugh and rejoice with them, while Titian's works, when compared to Michelangelo's, seem to be alive. Annibale's quest for untainted nature 
manifests itself in all its newness in the life drawings he executed in the early 1580s, at the time when he, his brother Agostino, and their cousin founded the so-called Accademia dei Desiderosi in Bologna. Having disregarded the majority of contemporary practices, sidelining the ever-authoritative examples of Michelangelo and Raphael, Annibale then decided to adopt and calibrate Correggio's drawing technique by combining it with elements of Venetian draftsmanship. Frequently rendered, this a little bit here they are, frequently rendered in red chalk on white paper, or less frequently, black chalk on blue colored paper, his early nudes exhibit the aura and appearance of work executed by a reborn neo-Venetian Correggio the bodies of his models contoured with roundness, eschewing any hint of angularity, purely modeled in light and bathed in impalpable fluid penumbra. Annibale's adoption and innovative elaboration of northern Italian draftsmanship meant that disegno, drawing, both its practical and theoretical sense, was now subordinated to light. In other words, the form of the human body is no longer predetermined conceptually in conformity with a set of proportions articulated through contouring, but is contingent upon extemporaneous lighting conditions. And this is a sort of extreme example. You can see the function of contour here in the case of Michelangelo's uh, drawing after life for an ignudo and the way in which Annibale proceeds, which is very, very different as you can see uh, in the way in which he prefers, he gives, you know, uh, he's much more interested in the effect of light on the surface and how it works. It is light, above all, that shapes and modulates the body, which thus becomes a luminous phenomenon, fluctuating, transitory, and not a given entity, an ideal object of knowledge, commanding a definitive viewpoint, function, and conceptualization. To a certain extent, Annibale managed to configure a sort of tonal drawing analogous to Correggio's quintessential sfumato, but also uncannily reminiscent of Giovanni Bellini's and his followers' handling of local color in its, it, sorry, in its interplay of broad, lucent surfaces and depthless, diaphanous shades. To visualize these effects in Annibale's painting, we could recall his Saint Sebastian in Dresden of circa 1583, in which the torso of the youth, arched forward and shielded from the sun's rays pouring in from above, becomes shrouded in flimsy penumbra, uniformly diffuse and just slightly darker than the, adja than the adjacent lit skin while light passages of black pigment softly mimic the puckering of the abdomen at the navel's level. Accordingly, other nudes drawn by Annibal in these early uh, years showcase a similar breadth of light, diminished shade, and insisted sinuous contours, such as the boy taking off his sock in red chalk, which you have here. In applying to drawing a tonal luminosity initially destined for painting, Annibali naturally resorted to the example of Correggio's draftsmanship. This is an interesting case, the one that I'm showing you here. This is an, an uh, Annibale, which is a, a, um, uh, a, the study of a foreshortened head in the Uffizi now, that at a certain point was even considered a Correggio, and then a Correggio nearby, you can see actually the way in which he is treating also the foreshortened head of the figure. However, Correggio's unrivaled ability to render the infinite gradations of light in red or less often black chalk by divesting the human figure of its corporeality was not exactly the goal pursued by Annibale. Indeed, it was not the dissolution of the body in an almost indistinct nebula of light and shade, but its rendering as a manifestation of structuring light that was essential for Annibale. And this is also another interesting example in which you can see the differences between Correggio and the way in which Annibale represents one of the figures of Correggio in uh, the uh, dome of uh, 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 Palma, Parma Cathedral. 
It is perhaps superfluous to note that the subtle chiaroscuro employed by Correggio in his drawings tends to accentuate the ideal thrust of the figure. On the contrary, Annibale wanted the figure to be anchored in nature, to be repossessed concretely as a natural, preeminently optical phenomenon. It is noteworthy that his repossession of the body through drawing required overcoming the Tuscan Roman definition of the contour as a prime tool of imitation without the possibility of suppressing the contour altogether. By subjecting it to the dictates of light, Annibale was successful in reasserting the indispensability of life drawing as a means for probing the artistic phenomenology of the natural body. Given the intrinsic limits of drawing as a medium, Annibale understandably reduced the extension and intensity of shadows in the extreme, resorting to shallow, semi-transparent penumbra, handing the body over to light without overexposing it. As a result, the contours not only demarcate the form, but especially curb and mediate the dissemination of light from within, granting the figure an ambivalent three-dimensional quality, a flattening relief. By combining crudeness with harmonious fluency in contouring and modeling the body, Annibale conjures up an impression of genuine immediacy, as if, relinquished any artifice, there had been no space for him to reflect upon the model and its graphic transcription on paper. This sense of genuineness is strengthened by a depersonalization of the models, insistence on their raw corporeality, disinterest in anatomy, and focus on the body's basic physiologic function, such as the act of sleeping. When their traits are not partially concealed through foreshortening or turned upside down, they appear deliberately hazy, like involuntary vestiges of a live drawing session. Put otherwise, they are living motifs, the degree zero in the life of an academy studio. In this regard, it is crucial to underscore that the way in which boys are depicted in Annibale's early nudes is truly unparalleled. It is irrelevant here whether these life drawings were executed during academic sessions, produced only for the benefit of, of Annibale and the strict members of the Karachi workshop, or made on a whim without apparent rhyme or reason. Sharing so many traits in common, both in terms of style and format, they blur the distinction between daily life, studio activity, and academic training. It is the porosity of these settings that heralds the disrupted novelty inherent in Annibale's vanguard. The frequency with which Annibale employed boys in his early drawing sessions is specific to the early years of the Academy, and the practice, apparently, ceased altogether over time as Annibale began to concentrate exclusively on more athletic and defined bodies. It is this later stage of the Karachi Academy that Malvasia may be evoking in recounting the vicissitudes of its first establishment. And I quote, here, there was never a lack of the best bodies, whether male or female, to serve as muscular and well-proportioned models. Here you have an example of a later drawing by Annibale, uh, probably dated uh, for, from the beginning of his uh, uh, period in Rome. He left in 1595, and very different, as you can see, in technique and approach to uh, the body. So this is probably this kind of bodies to which Malvasia referred in saying that in the academy at the beginning, there was this continuity, these beautiful bodies to be found. So, shockingly perhaps, at the beginning, Annibale dismissed the best muscular and well-proportioned bodies by purposely making use of the disproportional, anti-muscular, at times androgynous, and almost randomly chosen bodies of his younger recruits. A case in point is Annibale's remarkable standing nude youth facing right in the British Museum. Although hopeless, hopelessly wrapped, this study in red chalk is of great quality, sharing several features with models by Annibale of the early 1580s. Relevant, too, is its affinity in terms of proportion and physical structure, with the naked figure at the center of Annibale's allegory of truth and time, Hampton Court, of circa 1584-85. It is noteworthy 
that the youth in the drawing has often been misidentified as a girl, owing presumably to the smooth rendering of the body, substantially deprived of muscles, the bulging of the belly, and the erotic gesture of the arm bent over the head, while the hand nonchalantly holds the smock freshly removed, drooping behind the back and caressing the buttocks. It makes sense that boys, such as the one depicted in the British Museum sheet, served as models for female figures, like the personification of truth in Anibal's painting. It is striking, nonetheless, that no adjustment was made in order to feminize the youth's proportions, a standard practice in early modern workshops and one also followed by the Karachi. And you have here an interesting example of a sort of transitional figure. So this is actually a, a life drawing in which uh, Anibale starts thinking about the male body as a female figure. Huh? And we have other examples by Anibale in which this is also uh, evident. A strong argument can be made that both the boy in the drawing and the female nude in the painting preserve a childlike quality redolent of courageous figures expressed through their flowing, rounded contours and the attenuation and translucency of their shading. But the paradox of Anibale's bold attempt to expose raw nature in a softened, stylized form remains intact. In the end, the wavering outlines and sweeping lighting through which Anibale constructs the human form in his early life drawings results from a compromise his depiction of rough, at times ungendered, flesh, carne, would have been unacceptable without bestowing upon it the authoritative imprint of courageous soft style, his canonical morbidezza. While in distancing himself from antiquity, Annebale did not renounce wholesale the example of historical masters, Caravaggio went so far as to repudiate any previous canon settling on raw nature as his sole artistic paradigm. According to Giovan Pietro Bellori, this unfortunate deliberation occurred early on in Caravaggio's career. Not heeding at all the most perfect marbles and Raphael's celebrated pictures, but on the contrary, disdaining them, Caravaggio turned to nature as the exclusive object of his brush. Accordingly, once he had been shown the most acclaimed sculptures by Phidias and Glicon as opportune for him to study, he replied by simply stretching out his arm toward a crowd of people like you, claiming that nature had sufficiently provided him with masters. It was then, Bellori reports, that Caravaggio painted his fortune teller, alluding perhaps to the version now in the Louvre. Bellori's evocation of Caravaggio's artistic descent to hell comes with a bit of regret. Before this infamous turn, Caravaggio had proven himself a decorous painter by reviving the canonical style of Giorgione. After leaving Milan, Bellori records, Caravaggio spent some time in Venice, where he became so fond of Giorgione's coloring that he decided to imitate his example. This is why, Bellori notes, Caravaggio's earliest works appear soft, pure, without those shadows he used later on, and because among the Venetian painters who excel in coloring, Giorgione was the purest and the simplest in depicting the forms of nature with a few tints, so too did Caravaggio operate when he first directed his gaze toward observing nature. In Vellori's view, Caravaggio's penitent Magdalen epitomized this extraordinary softness in orchestrating color and chiaroscuro on Giorgione's model. In leaning her face slightly sideward, sideward this is Bellori, the cheeks, neck, and breast of Caravaggio's female figure appear to be tinged with a pure, simple, and true tint clear evidence for Bellori that Caravaggio was able, with a few pigments, to render the, true of the truth of colors. Already in his Meraviglie dell'arte, 1648, Carlo Ridolfi praised Giorgione for the same reasons. In the blends of flesh of this ingenious painter, there are not to be seen those innumerable hues of gray, orange, blue, and other similar colors that some of the modern masters tend to add in today, 
believing that in that way they reach the summit of art while stealing away with these procedures from the natural that Giorgione imitated with few tints appropriate to the subject he would undertake. This manner was also followed in antiquity by Apellis, Ikion, Melanthios, and Nicomachos, illustrious painters, who employed but four colors in forming the flesh. And you have here a beautiful example from the collection here at the Consistorisches Museum of the true and pure flesh of Giorgione's uh, painting. In crediting Caravaggio with a brief revival of Giorgione's pure nature, Bellori was acknowledging his ephemeral role, along with Annibale's much more enduring one, in emancipating the arts from the effects of the declining maniera. Removing any veneer and vanity from color, Caravaggio had contributed to the restoration of the human body. His invigorated tints had in fact restored blood and flesh. This is Bellori speaking. It bears remarking that both Annibal and Caravaggio embarked on an exploration of unmediated nature by resorting to the stylistic practices of two prominent, but at their time outdated or questioned masters, such as Correggio and Giorgione, to the detriment of antiquity, Raphael, or occasionally Michelangelo. However innovative, their pursuit of truth in the human body led them initially to an appreciation of the uncharted periphery of the maniera moderna. No doubt, Caravaggio's return to Giorgione, and you have here another beautiful example of what they meant by this return to Giorgione in the pure purity of tints in Caravaggio's early works. And of course, this is also a very damaged painting. It's very abraded, but you can have an idea of what uh, Bellori and others were referring to by comparing Caravaggio's to uh, Giorgione. No doubt, Caravaggio's return to Giorgione may qualify as a more radical enterprise insofar as it aimed to preserve the advances in color of the Venetian school before Titian by also discarding the Tuscan Roman paradigm of disegno. In spite of its newness, Caravaggio's reinvention of Giorgione's pristine carne viva remained within the boundaries of the canon by retaining one of the paramount features of the maniera moderna, its ability to represent the freshness of living flesh. In his life of Giorgione, Vasari cast Leonardo as the inspirational principle of Giorgione's coloring. Upon seeing some of Leonardo's works with their subtle transitions of color and tone and their exceptional relief conveyed by means of shadows, his style attracted him so much that all of his life he drew on it and based his work on it. This is how Giorgione formed figures so soft so well harmonized and so subtly blended that many of the great artists of his time admitted that he had been born to infuse life into painted figures. While Caravaggio was undoubtedly intrigued by Leonardo's work, he showed his predilection for Giorgione through his initial propensity, here we are, to uh, propensity for a painting with almost no darks thus entirely grounded on the juxtaposition of pure tints modulated through gentle and restrained shadows and conspiring to bring out the blood and flesh of the figure. It is perhaps no coincidence that, like Caravaggio, Annibale too applied intense softening in rendering the immediacy of the human body in his early work. The value of softness in both chiaroscuro and color with regard to the human figure was upheld also by Renaissance theorists opposed to Vasari. In his Aretino, Ludovico Dolci pointed out, now it is necessary that the blend of colors be gradated and united so as to represent the natural and nothing must remain that may offend the eyes such as the lines of the contours, which must be omitted since they do not occur in nature, and the blackness of fierce and disconnected shades. Light and shade, when laid out with judgment and skill, make the figures rounded and lend them the relief required. By the same token, Galileo Galilei, an almost contemporary of Caravaggio, endorsed the notion that painting emerges soft and round with force and relief by softly modulating the contours from one to the next without crudeness. In 1599-1600, 
while executing his two paintings for the Contarelli Chapel, Caravaggio ultimately abandoned all scruples, accentuating the contrast of chiaroscuro to unprecedented levels and leaving behind the softness of his Giorgione years. To paraphrase Dolce, Caravaggio set out then to introduce fierce and disconnected shades as a paradoxical means to achieve what no other artist had never attempted before, to transform the skin, pelle, of the canvas into a tangible fragment of viva carne, living flesh. In rolling out his new technique, Caravaggio, in a sense, turned the practice of the life drawing session into a lighting and coloring principle. Commenting upon this aspect of Caravaggio's evolution, Bellori rightly noted, Caravaggio became increasingly more renowned on account of the colors he was introducing, which were not soft and with few tints as previously, but thoroughly contrasted through vigorous darks, thus availing himself of black in excess so as to grant relief to the bodies. And he went so far in this way of painting that he did not let any of his figures outside in broad daylight. But he managed to depict them against the background of a confined room in the dark air, opting for a high light falling down vertically above the principal parts of the body and leaving the rest of the shadow so as to convey strength through a vehement chiaroscuro. Caravaggio's staging of the human body in a, a confined uh, room lit by one source of light alone may have brought to mind the context of the early academies. For instance, Malvasia in his Life of the Caracci relates that the three masters in their youth employed the first two hours of night to draw after life in Baldi's Academy. By the same token, Bernini advised that during the summer one has to draw after life in daylight and during the winter with the aid of a lamp. It is obvious that in these circumstances, the model was made visible through an artificial source of light located in specific spot and unique so as not to duplicate or confuse the resulting shades. The disadvantage of a single and distinct luminous body, this is Leonardo speaking, is already described by Leonardo in his manuscript E, where he also observes that this sort of lighting causes stronger relief in the object than a diffused light. During night sessions of life drawing, some screen may have been placed around the lamp so as to avoid the unpleasant effects of sharp, dense shadows. Leonardo accordingly recommends, put a frame in front of this nighttime light, either with oiled paper or instead, without making it translucid, an interleaf of fine chancellery paper. You will see your shadows without edges. In his David with the Head of Goliath of circa 1661, Caravaggio purposefully ignored these or similar recommendations. The wedge of shadow embedded at the right side of the neck intercepts the luminous blade of the tense tendon nearby, while the blade of the sword almost flung around the neck casts a dagger of darkness deep across the shoulder, inserting itself into the clavicle. The stretch of flesh between the lifted arm and the chest protrudes with energy, demarcated as it is by an oblique, abrupt shadow. More remarkably, Caravaggio creates almost no gradual transition between dark and light, so that dense shades cut neatly across spotlighted swathes of flesh. It is difficult for us to fathom the implicit unpleasantness of these details to an early Baroque beholder steeped in artistic prejudice. However, this fragmentation or erosion of the human body through an excess of black, this is Bellori, may have appeared not only repulsive, but also strangely enticing. Prodigiously, by virtue of fierce and disconnected shades, the bare flesh of a handsome boy was there not only to be seen, but to be touched by the eyes. Dissimulating the traces of the brushwork, Caravaggio recreated the section of the visible torso and right arm as organic matter, the compactness of the tight-knit shades forcing the lit surface to coagulate, to solidify its impression of continuity. This effect is usually associated with photography, but in a rather misleading manner. 
without magnifying the contrast of light and dark to extremes, no photograph and no painting could render this effect of enhanced tactility. Caravaggio must have understood this early on, although it must have been painful for him to flout the conventional principles of chiaroscuro in order to materialize and not just evoke the carne viva of his Venetian predecessors, from Giorgione to Titian. As a consequence, he paid the price of his reinvention of the human body by damning his art to harsh criticism and quasi-oblivion for almost three centuries. It is also fair to stress, without entering further explanation, that Caravaggio's technique changed considerably after these undeniable achievements. In his final works, in his final words, uh, works, Caravaggio indulged in unprecedented effects of non finito, using the dark prime as a half tone from which fluid layers of pigment detach themselves, forming films of hovering colors. Although heavily damaged, Caravaggio's late David with the head of Goliath manifestly avoids the sharpness of the earlier Vienna version. In the Borghese David, every trace of angularity disappears from the hero's face, which is on the contrary supplied with feminine roundness. In the youth torso, the obliques of the clavicles or of the musculature are attenuated into curving patterns, while the warm shades enfolding the torso progressively retract as the flesh yields to the flow of the incoming light. How are we doing? There is only the part on Bernini now, and it's going to be shorter. Unlike Caravaggio, Bernini believed that art does not tolerate raw nature, so that the human body should only be observed through the lenses of antiquity, or at least of the Renaissance canon. According to Bernini, Annibale Carracci had prompted him as a boy to draw after Michelangelo's last judgment for at least two years in order to learn the connectedness of the muscles. End of quote. Bernini apparently heeded Annibale's suggestion for a few years later, as he was drawing in the Academy after a life model, Ludovico Cigoli, laying his eyes on his work, exclaimed, you are a sly one, you are not doing what you see, this is by Michelangelo. The habit of transfiguring the life model in conformity with the proportions of a canonical body was so entrenched in Bernini that he did not hesitate to recommend exactly this procedure in teaching how to represent the human body. On 5 September 1665, he noted that it spoiled young people to have them draw in the beginning from nature, which is always weak and petty in so far as their imagination is filled exclusively with that, and they will always be unable to produce anything beautiful and grand, which does not exist in nature. Sometimes, Bernini uh, insisted, some parts in nature appear to come forward, they should not, and others that should come forward appear not to. A good draftman would leave aside what should not appear but is showed by nature and draw what must be there but does not appear. More to the point, Bernini elucidated his method for correcting the structure of his model's bodies in light of the ancient canon. One must render the legs rather longer than shorter, a little bit more adds to beauty, while a little bit less makes the figure heavy and ponderous. One must render men's shoulders broader whereas they are narrower in nature, and make the head slightly smaller than bigger. To better understand how Bernini decoded and re-encoded the model to be copied, one can turn to an early drawing he executed after the central figure of the Leocon group. On a preliminary basis, it is noteworthy that Bernini framed the figure as a mutilated torso by adopting an unusual point of view Bernini's manipulation of the standpoint is utterly genius. As he placed himself and the beholder on the left side of the sculpture, removing from view the upper part of Leocon's younger son and accentuating as much as possible the frontality of the torso, which appears instead to rotate when seen frontally. 
In doing so, he elongates the proportions artificially, even as he displaces the pulsating effects of contracting and relapsing muscles to the periphery of the torso. The flanks, armpits, and upper chest shudder in a centrifugal motion that is harnessed by the dissolving boundaries of the contours. In stark contrast, the abdomen, by extending upward to its limits, sinks inward as if to counterbalance the opposite pull of the lateral spasms. Even so, Bernini mitigates the hiatus between the outjutting arcade of the diaphragm and the cave deep abdomen. You can see here, if we go back very, very quickly, uh, you can see here that the diaphragm is, and the, the abdomen are much more intensely uh, uh, carved and delineated. Exerted from its narrative context, and if it were depersonalized, Bernini's torso turns into a paradox, an artificial device in which pain lessens into muteness and fluid motion, and agony manifests itself through delicacy. Bernini's tendency to soften anatomical relief by diminishing or even subduing the chiaroscuro may be discerned more appropriately in two drawings in red chalk he executed after one of the colossal statues of the Dioscuri in Rome. In the first sheet, the anatomical elements of the torso, depicted frontally, are indicated through subtle traits, schematically rendered with such flatness that the surface seems almost deprived of shades. Most important, the amplitude of the shoulders compared to the waist is slightly modified in view of elongation. Adjusting his standpoint, Bernini sketched the same torso laterally in the second drawing, this time almost impalpably, as if relief was resolved into surface while becoming translucid. Early on in his career, Bernini must have determined that in order to grant marble the softness and translucency of skin, it was necessary to imperceptibly flatten the relief and smooth out the anatomical demarcations of the body so that they cast semi-transparent shadows while diffusing the light gently across the surface. In his 1617 Saint Sebastian, which is here, Bernini seems to follow this procedure by further increasing the refractive effects of the marble through accurate polishing of the figure's fleshy parts. When you go there, just, you know, look at the flesh of the figure and look at the drapery around and you can see how they are rendered very differently. So just uh, if you have you know, five minutes, do that. Equally remarkable is Bernini's parsimony in evoking the presence of muscles, tendons, veins, or arteries under the skin. This is even more evident in later sculptures, such as the formidable Apollo and Daphne of 1622-25, in which anatomy is basically reduced to its minimum, just an enveloping form. Bernini's treatment of the marble may be related to a common fear among Baroque artists, the suspicion or quasi-conviction that in imitating the antique, they would lose the ability to infuse life and flesh into their works. In his De Imitatione Statuarum, for instance, Peter Paul Rubens remarks that even though novices apparently benefit from drawing after the antique, they instead derive from it a certain crudity sharp outlining and awkward anatomy, for they ended up represented in color merely marble and not flesh. Above all, Rubens continues, there is the difference of shadows, since flesh, skin, and cartilage, with their translucent quality, soften many steep descents into blackness and shadow, which stone inexorably presents as twice as, as strong because of its density. Similarly, Francesco Albani argued that it was for the best that Titian et Correggio did not busy themselves with ancient statues, concluding, because of their brightness and strong lighting in courtyards, all of the appearance of their faults, I refer to drapery, becomes evident. If one wants to imitate this through color, especially in the dark spots, neatly showing all the furrows and ridges of the faults, this will compromise and diminish the strength and harmony of their works. Although Albani does not specifically mention the human body, his comment on the faults and their accentuation of shadows as a result of the hardness of stone could easily apply to the skin and flesh of the sculpted figure. 
Of course, Rubens and Albani were concerned with painting. Bernini, whose primary focus was culture, was even more aware of these pitfalls. He must have realized that in order to give the impression of carne viva, a pictorial field fit by definition, the marble ought to incorporate the translucent quality, to paraphrase Rubens, of flesh, skin, and cartilage. By suppressing the effect of darkness determined by strenuous relief, the only viable solution was to thin out the shades into semi-transparency by modulating the marble surface almost undetectably. And you can see an example here in uh, the abduction of Proserpina, but especially, look at this, in order to give the sense of the fingers uh, touching uh, the flesh of the figure, you need to wear some millimeters almost of the surface. You have actually to carve it in such a way that you make it almost in impalpable. Hmm? If this was Bernini's conviction, then his avoidance of anatomical detail, detailing was not necessary due to his ambition to morph into flesh, to morph stone into flesh. In his Osservazione della Scultura Antica, circa 1657, Orfeo Boselli contends that the grand manner of antiquity involves a constant metamorphosis of nature. The grand manner resides in making words with suavity and softness, which consists of knowing how to hide bones, veins, nerves, and muscles, a thing so difficult that only the ancients were able to do so. What a wonder to see a most beautiful figure supplied with everything, though nothing is there to see a mind concerned with bones and a hand that generates flesh. Bosselli's observation reflects not only the ideas of his master, François Duquesnois, but also the experience and thought of Bernini. After many years spent exploring the secrets of antiquity, Bernini had come to reconfigure the human body in ways that not only defied nature, but deprived the anatomy, as it were, of its minutiae and articulations underneath that is, below the surface. In a sense, if both the young Annibal and Caravaggio had reinvented the human body through a varied approach to raw nature, in his own way, Bernini too had created a new typology of human body, one that, by exceeding nature, conformed better with a transcendent notion of divinity. Much more could be said about what I have elsewhere defined as the supernatural body. For now, I will stay content if by any chance I manage to convince the audience here that the Baroque body is not a mere re-elaboration, but a reinvention of the Baroque age. Thank you so much. <laughs>